It's my birthday! I'm one step closer to my inevitable demise. Let's review a cartoon! <laughs> so I've decided on each of my birthdays, I'm going to review something from the year I was born, 1987. Yes, that does mean I'm 30 years old. Shut up. Now since Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles happened to have debuted in 1987, I could have easily picked it for my first birthday review. But that's way too fucking easy. I should maybe review something that wasn't made to sell toys. You know, I say shit like that and then forget I'm talking about the 80s. Screw it, let's talk about this night show instead. Oh yeah, by the way, this was made by Hasbro, so if you thought I managed to find something that wasn't made to sell toys, <laughs> no, it had a comic book and everything. That doesn't make it inherently bad, mind you. I'll be focusing on the first three episodes so you get kind of an indicator of what you might be looking for if you want to check this show out yourself. Far away in a distant galaxy, I, Aku, the shape-shifting master of darkness, unleashed an unspeakable- Wait, I think that's the wrong show. L let me try to summarize the exposition here. Our setting is Prismos, a technological world that experiences what I can only describe as a space EMP that knocks out all the electricity, blah blah magic blah blah. So. As you can tell, we haven't even gotten to the plot yet, and already nothing makes sense. So you mean to tell me that all electricity is gone forever because of the fact that the suns aligned, wouldn't they unalign at some point and the electricity would go back? That's, that, that doesn't really make any sense scientifically. And on top of that, didn't you just say this? They had taken control of all their sources of energy. So what about those other forms of energy that aren't electricity. Do those just not work too? Because no, clearly the answer to all of the problems is magic. So now everything's basically post-apocalyptic medieval and the main knights on both sides of the battle happen to have giant fucking flat chest plates. That couldn't possibly be an indicator that they could say, stick an animal picture on there. If they happen to, I don't know, get magical powers somehow. A wizard shows up at both capitals to offer them magic. Because of course he fucking does, but you want to know what the wizard's name is? Are you sitting down? I want to make sure you're sitting down for this, because it's going to blow your mind. Okay, his name is Merklin. I know, right? How do they come up with this crap? Our main villain, Darkstorm, this program is just oozing creativity out of every orifice, dismisses him. But the hero man, Leoric, decides to go, which makes Darkstorm decide to go because... Hate boner? I mean, can you think of another reason? Oh, while we're here, let me introduce you guys to Mordred. These are really starting to sound like He-Man rejects. Mordred's entire character is that he sucks up to Darkstorm to the point where he repeatedly gets called bootlicker by nearly every character in the series. That's it. In fact, he comes back from spying on Leoric and laughs about Leoric believing in the magic. And then Darkstorm's all like, Well, shit, guess we gotta go to can't let Leoric have magic that I don't even believe exists. And basically treats Mortred like an idiot for believing the same thing he did. I'm starting to think that Mortred at some point is gonna star scream Darkstorm. This is the 80s, after all. On the way to the shrine, there are a bunch of challenges because mysterious old dude! The first of which gets passed by a guy who can run really fast, Witterquick. What the fuck are these names? And as it turns out, foul play is encouraged. Darkstorm cuts a rope bridge to stop a bunch of guys from following, and one of them survives by making a makeshift glider. His name is Arzon, and no, neither Witterquick nor Arzon get their names said at all in their first appearance. Generally speaking, if a character is a focus of a scene in any way, chances are they're going to get powers. In fact, there's even a bunch of one-on-one -on -one fights to establish characters. There's one with the only two female knights in the entire show, some dude who steals stuff, or random pair of dudes in an ice cave. Although there is one scene in all of this that's something other than that. Namely, the scene where Darkstorm finds a bunch of bad guy knights in a trap and makes them pledge loyalty to him. Which, I mean, well... <laughs> Excellent. Worthy subjects, I shall extract you. What about that girl, though? She, I wouldn't exactly call that pledging loyalty, dude. I'll fucking rip off your nipples and feed them to an alligator! Eh, close enough. Anyway, giant brawl, no one cares. Merklin's all like, hey, break that door, and... A nuclear explosion? They walk into the shrine. All right then, sure. Everybody gets an animal totem, yay! The totems are based on what they did during the challenges and most of them make sense, but I'm gonna go over the ones that really kinda don't. Cravex, for your deed, 
you shall earn the totem of the only airborne scavenger on Prismos, the Phylot. So Kravix gets the only animal that is extinct in the human world. Calling it right now, first main character to die. Mortred for bootlicking above and beyond the call of duty. I give you the scampering beetle. Yes, because the first animal I think of when I think of subservience is a fucking beetle. You're willing to use dinosaurs and crap, but you're not willing to use, like, a dog or something? But no, people respect dogs. And we can't give the villains anything that's not a joke, other than, you know, what's essentially a pterodactyl. Or a shark. And Darkstorm, for your incomparable climbing skill and general sliminess, you shall receive the totem of the mollusk. Oh, for fuck's sake, snake! It's sitting right there for you. I mean, there's being creative, and then there's disposing of all logic for the sake of creativity. I, I give you credit that the mollusk thing is kind of creative, but come on. Snake! Works perfectly. Anyway, the people have staffs with them, even though it's absolutely never explained why they had the staffs to begin with, get a spell they can use once before recharging back at the shrine. But about a third of the characters don't really have staffs, so uh, you know what they get? The power to sell more expensive toys. Seriously, they get to make a vehicle work and unlike the staff wielders, they don't have to recharge their powers. I think I'd rather not have a staff then. Anyway, Merkling kicks everyone out because he's a massive dick and then Darkstorm proposes a peace treaty he has no intention of upholding. Because, well, he's a massive dick. Guy I can't remember the name of rescues a woman from a giant ditch and- And it is a fair maiden indeed. She's evil. Never before have I met such a strong knight. Totally evil. What is that? My power staff. It is charged with great magic. You know, if I didn't know what was going on in this show, that would sound sexual. Oh yeah, by the way, she's evil. Tell me all you know of this fair maiden. I mean, besides the fact that she's evil. The young woman is the evil knight, Virolina. Holy crap, what a shocking twist that I didn't see coming. Episode 2! This episode is basically Good Guys Get Captured, the movie. But we do learn a few things about the overall lore. We learn that non-staff wielders get to use vehicles, like I said previously. And we also learn how each of the staffs actually function. I'm just going to give a basic rundown. So as revealed at the end of the last episode, the knowledge staff can tell you information about something or someone. But with that, we also learn something about the staffs in general. Namely, that there's apparently a rhyming couplet that activates each staff that the wielders just know because convenience. So let's get back to the individual powers. The light speed staff makes you move really fast towards a destination. That's pretty much it. Oh, and his animal totem is a cheetah, so it does basically the same thing. So essentially... He's Sonic the Hedgehog. He can run really fast, but other than that, there's not really much that he can do that other characters can't do better. The Strength Staff fires a magic arrow and the Invulnerability Staff does exactly what you think it does. So they cancel each other out whenever they're used against each other. So when the two sides are fighting, those powers are useless. The Wisdom Staff gets vaguely vague advice of vague vagueness. In this particular case, become one with the Circle of Light means form the Spectral Knights, you dumbass. Even though Darkstorm already called them the Spectral Knights. Already two of the Spectral Knights have fallen. So apparently Darkstorm knew who the Spectral Knights were before the Spectral Knights did. Good. The Destruction Staff destroys stuff, never would have guessed, and the Fear Staff makes spiders that apparently have Scarecrow Toxin in their fangs. Which kind of makes me think that Kravex should have gotten like a spider, and maybe Mortdrid should have gotten the Phylot, since his magic involves flying vehicles, but eh, whatever. Finally, the Decay Staff ages people, although it can undo its effects, apparently. And that's pretty much it. The main vehicle that the bad guys have can apparently remove animal totems, and they don't think to do this before throwing the good guys in jail. Which is stupid. I mean, they take ferals, but not the others. We also know that the machine can reverse the process, as we learn in the next episode, so... Why not just take the powers and then give them back when they pledge loyalty to you? If that's going to be your ultimatum. Blah, blah, blah. We the spectral dudes. Oh, no, it's waters. Episode three. The spectral knights restore the status quo. And that's pretty much the entire first half of this episode. Well, there is infighting between the darkling lords, which is fun. I gotta say, Kravex's tirade is pretty hilarious. I just wish he would have punched Mortred, but 
Hell, Mortred gets enough shit during this entire show anyway. The Spectral Knights wind up capturing the Darkling Lords, but Merklin sneaks them a magical key to escape. Which seems kind of weird, considering the fact that he condescends to the Darkling Lords a bit more. But as it turns out, Merklin gives zero fucks and wants them to retrieve the Dragon's Eye to get further power staff recharges. Of course, the Darkling Lords are petty motherfuckers, so they try to attack Merklin, which is stupid. Because what mage would give someone powers that can be used against the mage if the mage wants something out of it? So they go after the eye too. Turns out it's held by a wizard with a giant mechanical dragon. Who is that up there? He is the wizard Volkama, believed until recently to be legendary. Okay, cool, so we gotta fight the wizard. Volkama was in the same circle of wizardry as Merklin, Bogavas, Wizesquizar, and others. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, what was that last name? Wizesquizar. One more time. Right. Anyway, they beat the Dargan and play football with the Dragon's Eye. I'm getting a G.I. Joe Weather Dominator hockey vibe right about now. The Spectral Knights win and take it back to him, but demand Merklin give them magic to help with crops and shit. Although you'd think they don't really have anything to use as a bargaining chip in this situation, but apparently... We know you need the Dragon's Eye. Without it, the Sacred Pool will lose its magical power. How, though? There's been no indication that the pool has any kind of limitation, and even if you assumed that there was one, there's been no indication that the Dragon's Eye could restore any of the pool's power. Did, did you just guess? See, at least the Darkling Lords captured Falkama, so they might get information like this from him. But based on what we know, you've got nothing! The episode's over anyway, so fuck it. I partially based what I was gonna review this year on how ridiculous the plot synopsis sounded, but I'll be honest. This came across a bit more normal than the plot synopsis implied. Of course, part of that comes down to how much there is to explain. Really, the plot synopsis can only do so much, and there's a lot of info dumping in this show for an action show. Granted, having fewer action scenes probably makes it a little bit easier on the animation budget. The animation is kind of average for the 80s, but I would like to note that the first episode has a lot better than the other two. If you're into this sort of post-apocalyptic medieval setting, which I am, I'd say this is worth checking out a little bit more closely, but keep in mind there's plenty of cheesiness and terrible writing to go around in this show.